Ladies and gentlemen, good day and welcome to the Q4 FY22 earnings conference call of GMM Fordler Limited. As a reminder, all participant lines will be in the listen only mode and there will be an opportunity for you to ask questions after the presentation concludes. Should you need assistance during the conference call, please signal an operator by pressing star then zero on your touchstone phone. Please note that this conference is being recorded. And now hand the conference over to Ms. Priyanka Daga from GMM Fordler. Thank you and over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Stephen. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. A very warm welcome to all of you into the quarter four FI22 earnings call of GMM Fordler Limited. The earnings presentation was uploaded on these topic pages and it's also available on our website. Hope all of you had a chance to go through it. From the management, we have with us our managing director, Mr. Tarak Patel, our CEO of India Business, Mr. Asim Joshi, our CFO of India Business, Mr. Manish Poddar, our CFO of International Business, Mr. Alexander Pompner, and our company secretary and uh, compliance officer, Ms. Mittal Mehta. We'll give you a brief overview of the performance of the company, after which we will get into the Q&A. Before we begin with the overview, a brief disclaimer. The presentation which we have uploaded on these topic changes as well as on our website today, include, including our call discussions that is happening now, contains or may have certain forward-looking statements concerning our business prospects and profitability, which are subject to several risks and uncertainties. And the actual results could materially differ from those in such forward-looking statements. I will now hand over the call to Mr. Patel to provide an overview of the performance. Over to Zara. Thank you, Priyanka. Uh, good evening, everybody. So I think I would like to start off by giving you a perspective for the performance of this financial year. I think we have seen a significant improvement in revenues across both the India and international business. We are now a 2,541 crore company. Uh, not so long ago before the acquisition, we were about a 600 crore company, so significant change in size and scale. And the international business has performed exceedingly well. A company that started at about $175 million clocked a revenue in excess of $230 million, uh, which is just fantastic in terms of execution. So across the board, across the international business and the India business, execution has been uh, fantastic, and the revenue numbers, uh, they speak for themselves. Uh, on the profitability front, yes, we've had a bit of uh, impact on profitability. Uh, this is due to obviously the commodity price increases, metal prices have increased significantly, and in some European countries, namely Germany and UK, we've had an impact due to energy costs. We are already seeing cooling off of metal prices, and hopefully if this continues, you would see a positive impact on profitability in the coming quarters. In terms of order backlog, we begin this financial year with a 30% higher backlog than previous year, which is a very strong and healthy backlog for us. In most of our sites across the world, we have about six to eight months of backlog, and some even more than that. So we have good visibility for the coming year. The focus for the coming year is obviously to look at internal cost controls, uh, to look at ways of increasing profitability and maintain a similar level of execution uh, for the next few quarters as well. Uh, from a CapEx standpoint, a couple of interesting developments. Our Hyderabad uh, furnace is now uh, up and running. We got the final connection a few days ago, so that will add capacity to cater to the Hyderabad and Vizag area. Uh, our Brazilian furnace came online a few months ago and will help us cater to the U.S. market. The new furnace in the U.S. is also under uh, the commissioning and will come on board shortly. And then lastly, we have ordered a new furnace for Gujarat, which should come online sometime in September. We'll also add a lot of capacity, both for India and for supplying uh, internationally as well. Um, our Vatwa facility is now fully ramped up. We have about 200 people employed there. Uh, it's running at full capacity. Uh, when we expect Vatwa to have a good impact on overall growth story uh, here in India. Um, in terms of the industry that we cater to, uh, chemicals still, uh, still continues to be the driver for us here in India. Agrochemical and specialty chemical uh, continue to invest. The China One story is playing out quite nicely, and we expect investment to continue. 
with the cooling off of metal prices, we believe that some of the projects that were on hold will now be reinstated and new business will be coming in. But having a strong opportunity pipeline, there are many large projects that are going to be uh, ordered in the next few months and we see uh, the next few uh, quarters to be very strong from an order in place standpoint. There's also a bit of revival in the pharmaceutical industry. There is the PLI scheme, which is creating new capacity in Hyderabad and Vizag. A lot of the Hyderabad-based pharma companies are looking at setting up fermentation plants, and that would obviously lead to business for us in the making front. That's where we have some technology on fermentation, and these large fermentation vessels will require aggregators, which obviously GM and Fordler can supply. Uh, across the world as well, investments continue, uh, backlog remains high, uh, and new orders are uh, becoming in. Uh, however, I, as I said, uh, the only concern is the commodity pricing and energy costs. Uh, and if they start to kind of go uh, downward, you see that impact profitability in a positive manner. Uh, Besides that, uh, I also would like to uh, inform you that we have added a new independent director, Mr. Prakash Apte, who is currently the chairperson of uh, the Kotak Bank. He will join our board and he will replace our chairman after our chairman retires uh, after the AGM in August. So, uh, very good addition to our board. He brings in a lot of knowledge and experience. And from a uh, government standpoint, having worked with Kotak Bank, I'm sure he'll bring a lot of experience to the table as well. Uh, with that, I would like to hand over the call to Manish. Manish will take you through the quarter and the financial numbers for the year, and then we can then open it up for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tarek. Good evening, all. So let's move to the consolidated results for the quarter. Uh, consolidated results, we were uh, on the revenue front. We were just shy of 700 crores with a 9% growth over quarter three. Uh, EBITDA margin stood at 10.2%. Uh, cost pressures continue for this quarter as well on account of metal and energy. However, on business outlook perspective, we have a strong backlog of 1,932 crores, which is 30% higher than last year, so which uh, reflects a strong business outlook for the future. Uh, moving on to the full, uh, full year for console results, uh, we clocked a revenue of 2,541 crores with an EBITDA of 330 crores at 13% of March. Uh, here it's important to mention that during this quarter, we had a 17 crore of debit tax asset being charged off to the p &L. This is related to the uh, previous years, and this is a non-cash item and helps us in cleaning up the balance sheet. However, in cleaning up, this debit tax asset had to be charged to the p &L, and therefore you see a higher tax charge for this quarter to that extent. Uh, moving on to the cash flow statement for the full year, uh, we generated uh, 270 crores of uh, cash from business. Out of that, 99 crores was reinvested back into the business on account of working capital and CAPEX. And thereafter, uh, 124 crores was, in, uh, was repaid on account of debt, lease, interest, and dividend payout. And the balance 48 crores is added to the cash in hand. Uh, moving on to the consultant balance sheet. Our balance sheet continues to gain strength. Our net debt to EBITDA is at 0.5, net debt to equity stands at 0.3. And what's also heartening to note is pension liabilities have gone down from $60 million to $50 million. As the interest rates rise, the present value of the future payables go down as per the actual valuation. So this helps us in reducing the pension liabilities as well. Uh, moving on to the profitability matrices. EPS continues to grow to 91.4 uh, rupees per share. ROE and ROTE also show uh, uh, now in a healthy zone. ROTE being at 22 percent and ROE being 25 plus percent. This, that obviously proves that the Fordler acquisition has been value created for the shareholders. Uh, on integration, uh, direct origin, a few things about it. So we can go to the income statements for quarter four. Uh, this uh, is probably the last quarter where we show this breakup in slide number 15 between what the business has performed, what the accounting adjustments have been, and stacking up to the reported numbers. Uh, the only significant item is on the column C's uh, taxes. 17 crores is something that we spoke about already. Uh, 
In the interest of time, rest of the slides we may skip, but and we may just go directly to the last slide, which is slide number 30 on account of working capital. Uh, on the working capital, on the left side, you see the consolidated numbers. Uh, inventories uh, have risen from uh, 530 crores to 670 crores. Uh, obviously, because of middle price hedging, we have to buy more material, but what's heartening to see is customer advances have also risen from 288 to 422 crores. So therefore, the net funding at a group level uh, remains almost stagnant from 242 to 247 crores. So the inventory days also in net net have reduced on a console basis, although the backlog has risen from 1500 to 1900 crores. Uh, trade receivables have been managed uh, well at the static at 51 uh, days. Uh, payables also uh, have been extended from 48 to 56 days and primarily on the count of India. And as we move on to standalone numbers, you see uh, inventories have risen in India from 113 to 231 crores. And uh, you, you can appreciate that India business is primarily on the count of technology and service systems and low services components. So we had to make sure that the backlog or uh, higher backlog, we had to uh, make sure that the inventories are in that, our hand uh, to avoid uh, any metal price uh, increases. Um, therefore, the inventory days have increased from 32 to 61 days for the uh, 31st March 22. However, that piece we have tried to uh, reduce uh, on the working capital side by receivables reducing from 64 to 54 days and payables increasing from 53 to 71 days. By doing these two pieces, we have tried to maintain the cash conversion cycle. With this, we can open the uh, call for the Q&A. Uh, so, Stephen, maybe we can uh, open the call for Q&A. We'll be happy to answer any questions that uh, we have with us. Thank you very, uh, very much. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on their touchstone telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles. The first question is from the line of Javid Shikawat from Ambit Capital. Please go ahead. Sure. Tarek, firstly, in terms of the strategic plan that uh, we are awaiting, could you please throw some light on the avenues for the growth for revenue as well as uh, improving your profitability as well as uh, your revised guidance for the consolidated entity as well? Right. So we are currently working on our new equity story as well as uh, our future outlook. Uh, we are currently in the process of getting this done. Uh, due to the uncertainties in the global market, it is taking a bit longer. Uh, however, for the next year, I would say that, you know, obviously the international business grew at 20 plus uh, percent. I don't think that's going to continue. The idea for the international business next year is to really focus on profitability. Uh, but the India business obviously will continue to grow. We have two new uh, factories here, one Hyderabad and one in uh, Katwa, which will definitely add uh, significant revenue and growth here in India. But from a timing standpoint, we are now looking at uh, August to have a capital market day and come out with a new uh, three-year uh, uh, equity story slash uh, kind of a guidance document. Uh, and I think that is when we'll be more comfortable to give you uh, some kind of guidance. Sure. And uh, also, we understand that uh, the employee expenses for your international operations, these stand at roughly 30% of the revenue. So wanted to understand uh, what kind of revenue growth, their ramp, revenue ramp up are we looking at so that uh, that percentage of employee expenses as percentage of revenue comes down to more manageable levels for the international operations. Right, so I think currently the focus in the international business is improving profitability through internal uh, kind of initiatives. I think many of them will, like for example, let's say operational excellence, the two new factories, Germany and China, are now running at full capacity, so there'll be better absorption definitely over there. 
We are also looking to penetrate new markets through India-made value-sourced equipment. We're doing fully made Indian equipment into some European countries like uh, Spain and Russia and the U.S. Uh, you know, we also look at uh, Germany buys a lot of components from India. So all of these will help us increase revenue. Uh, but just to give you a number in terms of revenue growth, I think it will be too early. I would say, you know, the, the European businesses grow in the range of 5 to about 7%. Uh, this year has been an exceptional year. Uh, you know, you will see some growth there, but I'm not very comfortable to give you a definite number right now. Maybe in August I'll be uh, in a much better uh, position to do that. Sure, but uh, any update in terms of how much more investments will you have to make in manpower over there in order to grow your international operations? No, so there is no plan of adding people anywhere. Uh, and just to add here, not a single employee has left the Fordler Group since the acquisition. Uh, we are not adding any people. We are just maybe one furnace in Brazil to cater to the U.S. market because Brazil acts as a low-cost source for the Americas. In America, we are refurbishing an equipment. Uh, so there's no real major capex going on. If anything, we would even look to rationalizing some manufacturing uh, equipment. Right now, we have three facilities in Europe, maybe one too many. So we can look there as maybe uh, a way of uh, rationalizing our manufacturing. And as more and more stuff moves to India, we can use India to do the heavy lifting and then the final assembly, the testing, the finishing can be done uh, in the European or the American facilities. Sure, sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harshil Sepia from AUM Fund Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, sir, I just had a question. Uh, looking at the international business, our order intake has uh, drastically dropped for the quarter. So what might be the reason for it? Are we seeing that the demand environment is, uh, you know, very costly mm -hmm. in these prices or what is happening? Can you just elaborate? No, so there are a certain kind of few items which obviously has impacted international profitability. Uh, one is an impact of higher energy costs in the range of about 300,000 euros, which is maybe a 0.5% impact on profitability. On top of that, we've had a large order for Russia in the range of about 700,000 odd dollars, uh, which we had provided for because, you know, obviously due to the war, we were not able to ship. And there's another provision for a one-time expense for an M&A. We are planning to sell one of our group companies in the portfolio. So that has also been provided for. So about basically a 1.5% impact on profitability of the international business just uh, be coming from these one-off items. Okay. And uh, are the new orders which are currently being taken are uh, at higher margins? Yeah, so we've been very picky and choosy. Uh, we've changed our strategy over the last few quarters. We've kind of held our nerve and decided to kind of wait it out. And uh, I'm happy to kind of report that we have been able to really win really good margin business, uh, especially here in India for the glass line business. Internationally, they've always managed to get a premium and they've always been uh, quite clear in terms of what orders they would take. So I think the quality of our backlog has definitely improved in terms of uh, margins. And hopefully if the metal prices support, uh, you know, as we start going down, then you will see a double impact probably, one on pricing front and one on the lower input cost front, which would then obviously positively impact the profitability. Uh, okay. So earlier when we had acquired uh Fordler Inc. Uh, we had, you know, we had a, a four-year plan and we had guided for 14% EBITDA margins. So can we say that, you know, that it can be achieved in FI23 itself with our focus now on profitability rather than uh, from revenue growth? So we always try to improve profitability, but I would just uh, give you a kind of, uh, just I think wait till August, everything will become quite clear. Uh, as a group, we, have, you know, we definitely see a lot of possibilities, both in terms of growing revenue through new markets, uh, you know, profitability improvement to some of these uh, initiatives that we are working on, like low cost sourcing, uh, like uh, cost optimization. So we are really working hard to make sure that we come back to uh, a good level of profitability. Uh, and that's something that we will definitely come back to you maybe in August and give you some kind of guidance in terms of what the next three years will look like. Okay. 
sir uh, i had a few questions on the india business also so uh, is our vatwa facility now up and running at full utilization levels or uh, still uh, is, is it in the ramp up phase yeah, i have to repeat your shit yes the vatwa facility is fully up and running now as of so q4 uh, so we have a healthy backlog there as well so we do expect a lot more product to be shipped out of vatwa in this semester okay uh at full utilization levels what kind of revenues can it contribute to the overall uh, india business yeah, yes. so it really depends on uh, the product mix the material the construction etc so uh it, you know ultimately this can be about a 400 crore or so this is quite really come down to what products are being made and particularly what material of construction is being used that's roughly that for the range that one can think of at its full capacity in in coming years yeah. you, you said 150 crores right you know the 400 crores is what the plant capacity is uh, last year we closed the heavy engineering business i think for 120 crores uh, the six month for oh, sorry 140 crores so you will see a significant improvement this year because as you uh, just heard we now that uh, that's actually fully ramped up and would add significant revenue for that business and uh, so uh, on the last part of the question uh, you know our order intake for q3 was 696 crores for the international business which has dropped to almost half at around 343 crores so what might be the reason for that so so this is a combination of reasons but i think overall it was basically to make sure that we book a good profit a uh, good margin order because we had a strong backlog so the strategy was obviously to go after very lucrative business uh, in q1 this year we already had a record april uh, month both in india and internationally and we are pretty much now back to the similar levels of or the backlog so um, i think we are okay from that standpoint thank you the next question is from the line of amar moria from alpha credit advisors please go ahead yeah uh, am i audible sir yes go ahead so sir couple of questions from my side uh, like you know uh, what would be now the current facility of gle in india at this point of time and what would be the utilization level in this quarter so the current capacity before the new furnaces will come in this is not counting the new furnace in hyderabad that just came online a few days ago and uh, the new furnace in gujarat would have been around the 3000 eu per year range uh, about 2000 400 500 in gujarat and about 300 uh, all in hyderabad so the 3000 would be the total uh, the capacity i think you are understand no i think that's about the total capacity yeah but with the new policies coming in uh, we will at that point also need to update the capacity because the new policy which was the large policy and will add a good amount of capacity the hyderabad one also will add capacity so we might need to come back with a new number on the total new capacity here in india okay and what would be the utilization in the current quarter i would say full capacity i think both the plants were running at full capacity and when i say full capacity obviously the glass planning furnace is run 24/7 in three shifts uh, fabrication runs for two shifts so i think we are pretty much at full capacity in hyderabad we've also made some changes to the flow and stuff we try to kind of bring in operation excellence so there will be some improvement possible but generally we are running at 80 and 90% uh, utilization okay and the india now sir since the metal prices and other uh, glass lining everything has gone up so like you know earlier you used to guide like you know the per unit realization for the gle in india would be around 20 lakh so it would be around uh, w- what would be the average realization now so actually i think the 20 lakh number is on the higher side what we had i think so our normal one eu which is about 6300 liters is about 16 17 lakh odd that was the current price range is uh, it would have increased since then but the eu side might have also increased i don't have the data on the top of my head but knowing that they increase prices over the last few months i would think that those prices would definitely have increased okay okay and so now this glass line uh, specifically for the india uh, i mean this quarter the revenue has degrown but you are indicating now from here on as the new capacities are 
uh, there and you can expect a good order book in this particular year so i mean what should we expect like you know what kind of a growth in a gle standard one business could be in the next year so i think i, I don't think we have deep grown in the glass and i think last time year on year we are actually i'm talking percent. about the quarter i'm talking about the quarter Oh, the no. quarter may be, yeah, may be a bit of a, yeah. But, so again, you know, sometimes there are questions of shipments that was sent out and, you know, maybe some of uh, the customers didn't lift, but generally our glass line business, now with the new capacity coming in, uh, we should be growing at a double digit uh, early team kind of number. Uh, again, with the market share that we have, which is in currently in excess of 50%, a significant improvement in market share will come at a cost, right? So we don't really want to go after uh, the low end of the market. We want to kind of uh, stabilize our market share, but really go and pick the high value uh, order. If we have excess capacity, I would rather use it to either to export, so sell to the Fordler group, which obviously is much more lucrative, to really focus on the services and spare part business again, it's not a very large component. We expect that business to grow over the next few years because the number of uh, equipment that we keep supplying to the Indian market will continue to grow. Our uh, install base has increased to maybe now close to you know 20, 30,000 reactors in India. They all are aging, so hopefully that will be another lever of improving profitability. Uh, but in all in all, the focus is definitely to kind of pick and choose the right business uh, going forward. And I'd just like to add to one thing that Tarek said. Uh, the premise of the question was about degrowth quarter on quarter. Um, I just checked, we actually have grown uh, uh, just a little bit. It's from Q3 to Q4, we've actually grown in our last nine business as well. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one at this time. Next question is from the line of Ashish Kavra from Fairdale Traders. Please go ahead. Ashish Kavra, your line is in talk mode. Please proceed with your question. Yes. Uh, so, Parak, uh, two small questions. One is, uh, what will be the margin guiding for FI23? And, uh, and like, uh, can you share some uh, revenue guidance also? Not for the next year, but for like FY24 or FY25? So, um, well, the guidance for next year, again, like I said, uh, the focus is definitely on improving profitability. I think currently the India business is around 17 to 18 uh, percent EBITDA margin. I would like to believe that we would be maintaining something along the same line, maybe improving it slightly. Uh, the international business are uh, currently around 9-10%. I think you'll see some improvement there as well. Uh, if we are then supported on top of that with metal prices going down quite a bit, uh, that would just further add to the improvement as well. Obviously, keep in mind that there is definitely a lag between the time the prices come down to the actual time when we use these materials. So there will be a short lag of maybe a, a quarter or a few months. Uh, but otherwise, um, I think uh, that in this kind of challenging environment, I think if the focus should be more on internal cost measures to look inwards and see where are the areas that we can really kind of uh, be very much more efficient. So, but, uh, but otherwise, I think that these levels that we currently are enjoying in property, both India and international, uh, should be quite easy to maintain, if not improve upon. Okay, and uh, Tarak, any review guidance like if you can give for FY23 or 24? In terms of revenue guidance? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so maybe just wait till August. Everything will be quite clear. We work, we're working on it. You know, obviously we had a plan in place, but you know, these uh, challenging times have kind of uh, impacted obviously a little bit in terms of the outlook. But we we'll have something for you very shortly. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jason Sones from Ashika Stock Broking. Please go ahead. So, 
one question i just wanted to ask you know in terms of this that you know so when you look at pharma and chemical capex you know a lot of pharma chemical chemical capex uh, clearly the trend has been shifting from the high cost destinations which are us and europe to the east so countries like china india benefiting from this demand shift especially due to low cost and various other advantages so uh, now i just wanted to understand so of course a lot of uh, volatility all over the world and clearly there is a mark shift here so what i understand is there is a china plus one start, uh, china plus one shift for sure and there is also another shift which is seen in a lot of this uh, high end work uh, countries have kind of realized that it's not wise to depend upon uh, you know a certain country x so why basically you do all the high end work be it pharma capital chemical capex or whatever but keep it to yourself you know uh, in it, it, it's sort of a protectionist measure so are you seeing this trend being developed all over the world and if this trend does develop it will really benefit podlo as in your acquisition as well you know and your value sourcing and other strategies do you see this kind of strategy being played out this trend being played out the china plus plus home country you know that kind of uh, trend being played out uh, over the world do you see this trend taking shape yeah so i tend to agree with you there's definitely two major trends happening the india trend in investment and having a kind of a de-risking of china is definitely uh, happening you can clearly see that with the kind of uh, you know uh, work that is going on for company like srf pi industries dexin a lot of product is moving from china to india and that's a very small percentage so even if another 5 or 10% were to move in move to india that would be a massive massive amount and would require a massive amount of capex right so that definitely a trend that we are seeing we also know that the indian consumption of uh, specialty chemicals agrochemicals will also keep increasing uh, so that's something that will continue to be a strong driver many of the chemical companies have recently kind of you know got listed been in capital market so those guys will also continue to need to add capacity to obviously maintain uh, their growth momentum so all these things you will definitely see investments in the chemical uh, you know sector here in india the thing about chemicals is that their reactions are also much more critical so the need for higher quality bigger sizes also increases so that's where we really have a very strong foothold so that would be definitely something that we would really want to go after mm-hmm. from an international standpoint i completely agree with you what we've seen over the last maybe 18 months is there definitely been uh this kind of nationalistic drive where countries who were over dependent on india and china are building local uh, the redundancy you know they were dependent on you know life saving medicine like antibiotics and paracetamol from india and china uh, and then during the pandemic obviously it, overnight everything stopped right so i think that kind of revival is being seen we be seeing this clearly in europe uh, you know one of our subsidiaries in mabad has nearly a two year backlog which we've never seen in our life there's something that is driving this and this drive is really being created by new capacity being created in europe Uh, similarly in the us we have had a large order from the us for latex manufacturing again something that they were dependent on malaysia for but they want to create capacity within their own uh, geographies as well so i think these two trends will continue and obviously both well for gm and for india but also for the international business sure thank you sir and uh, another question i had is uh, you know in terms of manufacturing process so obviously you're the uh, uh you are the forefront in gl equipment so i just wanted to know in in sort of the core dna is there a difference between the manufacturing process different for example just uh, just if i have to take the local context hna glass coat is here is a uh, second uh, uh, in market share so is there a, ma- a major difference between the manufacturing process i understand podlo has glass steel which is patented and trademark and trademark So, just wanted to understand: Is there any significant difference uh, in terms of a manufacturing process or a, or a technological difference between these two? If you could, if you could elaborate. Manufacturing really is the same process that they would follow. They might have different firing cycles for the different glasses, but really, where the technology comes in is in two areas. One is the quality of welding that you do because glass lining, by its nature, the welding is not good enough, will kind of chip off and will be damaged quite quickly. So, welding is becomes very important. and two is the formula of the glass itself right so this is a formula glass that has been developed over the last maybe 100 years has keeps going to improvement formula germany works with the local universities and tests and we are actually currently working on a new glass 
uh, which we hope to launch maybe in the next few quarters. Uh, ESG compliant glass, which is heavy metal free, good for the environment. That's something that we're working on. But glass is basically the technology that differentiates our equipment from somebody else's. And that will directly correlate to the life of the reactor, right? the life use of the reactor. The better the glass formula, the better the glass quality, the, best, the, the longer the reactor will last. So I'll just add, uh, I mean, at a macro level, the process is similar, right? And a good way to think of it is in terms of an analogy, perhaps, with car making. So is a Toyota the same as a Fiat? Is it the same as a Ford? Uh, clearly, they all are building cars, but the product you get at the end of the day is very different. So similar in glass line vessels, uh, you know, our vessels last uh, longer. Uh, provide greater performance and therefore are the preferred choice amongst our customers. Sure. And uh, so just wanted to um, also, if you could elaborate, uh, it just gets talked about less. Uh, you have clearly had a brand uh, strategy and a realignment, uh, you know, and a local plan as well. I can clearly see that. So uh, could you talk about more of such initiatives such as, you know, Mixian, Interseal, Equialoy, which gets talked about less actually? In concourse or other other aspects. So, if you could just throw some light on Interseal, Mixion, Equali, what what plans do you have for you know taking these sub segments forward? Yeah, that's a good question, and we only talk about the last line because you only ask us about the last line. So, it's not by choice that we would like to speak uh, about the last line. But that's obviously a big chunk of our business, and people understand that. So, that's where the main the most of the questions come from. But we recently completed our rebranding exercise, so we now have a unified global brand. We have a common website within the group. Everybody will move to a gmmforder.com website. There's clear alignment. Uh, a team, myself and Manish, were in Germany last week. Uh, we had a factory visit to the glass planning facility in Backhausen. We went and saw our lab process equipment in Normand. And like you mentioned, we went and met the people at Interseal. Interseal, uh, the Dry 9000, is a very, very high technology mechanical steel that's doing really well. When Fordler bought this company a few years ago, it was a revenue of $3 million. Today, it's talking about $10 million of revenue. So in three years, uh, in, in one and a half years, it's grown like three times. Uh, very profitable. They have developed a mechanical steel that we call H5000 for the India market, specifically fully made here in the Indian market. We've launched that already. We expect those sales here in India to improve. The good part about mechanical steel is it also gives uh, you know a lot of aftermarket business. So the service and components and the spare parts for mechanical steel is also very lucrative. We now plan to launch this A5000 steel in the Chinese market. We decided on hiring a resource there dedicated for this mechanical steel. Again, this market could be as big as 10, 15 million dollars in the, in the first three years, right? So huge amount of uh, the potential there. Uh, then, like you said, we have uh, Mixion Agitation, where we kind of are mainly an India-based player, where we sell about uh, 70 odd crores of agitators. Uh, we are in the process of now working with fermentation, so we received a very large order from a Hyderabad-based company for agitation for fermenters. This is for uh, Benji uh, plants that they are uh, they're putting up. So that could be a great area for growth as well. And then Equiloy is our he uh, heavy engineering business. Again, I spoke about this earlier that our facility will be fully catering to that. Uh, and then Normag is also a nice, interesting business. Obviously, uh, it's something that is growing. Uh, we expect that business to double in size in the next two to three years as well. Uh, and that is really lab process equipment. So these kind of all glass equipment that go into any of the pilot plants. So all in all, we have a nice portfolio of products. They are kind of interconnected. They go to the same customer. So cross-selling becomes quite easy for us. Uh, and the idea eventually is to kind of build on this portfolio, add more complementary products so we can kind of have a wider basket of products that we can go and sell to the customer. Sure, sir. And this, uh, uh, you know, this last quarter has been very volatile, you know, in terms of world markets, you take any aspect that's been quite volatile in terms of the Russia, Ukraine war, etc. and a lot of other factors. Just wanted your sense on the end market demand, domestic and export both, and any major impact of this Russia, Ukraine, on European demand especially? No, so I don't think there's been any uh, impact of the Ukraine crisis on the demand in Europe. 
what happened is energy costs have gone up in general uh, in Germany and in the UK, but generally, otherwise, the business environment is quite strong. Alex is here. Maybe Alex, you want to add a word on what the economic situation is like in Europe? No, no, no. I could fully echo what we just said. So, um, energy costs is definitely the key impact on us, but um, otherwise, um, we are doing fine, and um, our Russian business is so far also um, compar comparable to more. Yeah, so we didn't have too much exposure in Russia. Russia was a market that we would have liked to kind of uh, enter into, so that obviously is pushed back. But generally, I think the business environment continues uh, to be quite positive. Uh, I mean, obviously, if we go over start returning in normal, that would be definitely a better situation. Uh, but otherwise, I don't feel that it's really something that's impacting business in the long term. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Nandageshwar Diwate from Maximus Securities. Please go ahead. Hello. Uh, the year is over, and I think very much congratulations are in place. Congratulations, Tarek, your Indian team, as well as your overseas team. I think they have done a fantastic job. I, I normally don't go to a quarter by quarter performance. I only look at it from here. So from where we came, I think we have come to a tremendous position. So, Thank you. Co congratulations on that. I have just one simple question, though. I, I didn't see it covered. Maybe you have covered it elsewhere, and that is not pertaining to the company, the book man. Uh, can you take us to the rationale of uh, the bonus? Yeah, so the bonus, uh, I've been getting this question for the last five years since I took over as MD. So, every year during the AGM or at some of the investor calls, I always get. Uh, uh, when the next bonus would be. I think the idea behind the bonus really, and this is something that we were getting requests from investors, fund houses, that they would like to be part and participate in our growth story. However, uh, the availability and the liquidity of the share was something that was holding them back. Uh, hopefully, this bonus issue will kind of help us increase liquidity. Uh, it's a tax efficient solution for the shareholder who currently hold GM and toddler shares. Uh, but the idea really is to kind of uh, increase and improve liquidity. Uh, also, you know, after completing the acquisition, you know, there were obviously questions around Indian companies buying international businesses. Many of them did not, you know, do so well. Uh, I think today, after one year of fully integrating both businesses, I can proudly say that we've done a fantastic job, both in terms of revenue, uh, I see the motivation, the experience within the group. I was there uh, just meeting people. Everybody's excited to be part of this company now. They finally have an owner that understands the business, who's continuing to invest in the business. So I think that we are now in a situation where you will see benefits uh, accruing over time. And it's a good time to also reward shareholders who stood by the company for these many years. And you know, after one year of the integration now fully complete and back to business as usual, I thought, we thought that it would be a nice time to reward our shareholders as well. Very good. In fact, that's the perfect answer that I was looking for. Had it been anything else, I may have been a little disappointed. I, and really, uh, I would like to repeat, it's a fantastic performance under challenging conditions. Uh, what you. what your took, uh, team undertook uh, was a daunting task. I, I think you'll compare to yourself and take a bow, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants, please limit your questions to two per participant. Should you have any follow-up, may be requested to rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of Siddharth, an, individ an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi, congratulations on the result. Um, I just want to know the rationale behind the headlong divestiture, uh, given that, I mean, based on what little I've read, at least it seems like quite a synergistic business, which is also profitable. Right, so Edlon is a product that, you know, it's not core to our main business, has a different customer base. Uh, so that's why as part of our, you know, our the portfolio, we will be adding companies, but I think it's only wise to also uh, remove something that's not really adding too much value. Even though the company does a revenue of around $12 million and about $2 million EBITDA, uh, for the next level of that company's growth, we would have to invest another 2 to $3 million into that business, which we really are not sure if we would like to do. Uh, and being, uh, you know, 
Riedlon has quite a good brand globally, uh, and if we could get a good valuation for it, I think it's better to kind of divest Edlon and use the proceeds to kind of add uh, a new company to the portfolio that kind of fit in much better with the complementary aspect of our business. Sure, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohit Ori from Progressive Shares. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Tarak. Uh, continuing with the uh, question for Edlon. Uh, what sort of uh, approximate valuation do you think you'll get from uh, 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 sale of this uh, uh, segment? So we don't know yet. Uh, the process is uh, onwards, but I think uh, the book value is 100 crores. About 100 crores is the budget. Yeah, 100 crores. Book value is about 100 crores. Uh, we don't know. We haven't got this yet, but uh, depending on the demand, you know, we always would like to buy cheap and sell expensive. So hopefully we can get a good uh, value for it. Okay. Uh, there's another uh, 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 property that you intend to sell in Mumbai. Can you take us through that? Uh, what was the uh, area and uh, what is the square meters of that property? Okay, so uh, I think square meters, I, don't, I would not know, but uh, it's our old office building. We actually moved from Lower Perel to Wadala office. Uh, we have a much bigger office, and that office currently is not being used to full capacity. We would rather use the funds for better cash management, and that was an own office that we owned. It is a prime real estate on the top floor of Peninsula Tower, so there will be high demand for it. So that was one uh, thought behind it. Uh, the other was a residential uh, apartment that the company owned. I think that also in a, in a building that has become considerably older, so it's a good time to kind of uh, divest that as well and then use the proceeds uh, for business purposes. And the approximate value of these two properties uh, would be? I don't know offhand, but when we bought the office, uh, the office was around five crores or something like that for about 6,000 square feet, if I remember correctly, something on those lines. It was very early on, we bought it really in uh, early 2000s before low apparel was even low apparel. So, uh, you get a good value with low apparel. Yeah. Okay, uh, you touched upon uh, you know, uh, parking the proceeds in some new business. Uh, what what uh, sort of uh, business are you looking at? Will it be going towards the uh, green chemistry kind of a business or or uh, something that you'd like to share? So we are always looking out uh, for good company. Uh, the the M&A market in Europe is hot right now. I think a lot of people look at Fordler now being a global company to piggyback on Fordler to really give them the global reach. So we get a lot of uh, you know requests uh, and a lot of uh, memo uh, the MOUs and uh, the memorandums, info memorandums to kind of look at. But we really want to uh, get into businesses that are very similar and cater to the same kind of uh, customer base that we are currently catering to. Uh, and like you rightly said, we would love to get into something on a technology process, green chemistry, automation, digitization. Those are the kind of things that, see, as a company, we have a very strong base and we have a very strong brand name. But I think we need to kind of bring in new tech, new age technology to kind of really, um, you know, add value. Uh, you see, you want to just jump in and... Yeah, I, I guess I'll just say, you know, we, we always run a very disciplined process. Uh, around the targets we go after, and you know we'll continue to do so. Um, so you will see our track record uh, is, is pretty strong uh, around the portfolio of companies that we have, and I think you can expect the same, uh, if not more, diligence uh, in years to come. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Harshil Setia from AM Fund Advisors. Please go ahead. Hi, sir. Uh, so I just want to ask, so are, uh, is our furnaces in uh, Germany all uh, gas-based or? No, they are electric furnaces in Germany and in the UK. Okay. Okay. Uh, <coughs> no, that's it from my side. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Ashish Kabra from Fair Deal Traders. Please go ahead. Ashish, we can't hear you. Yes, Tarak, can you hear me now? Yeah. 
Yeah, so one small question from my side. In the presentation, you had actually mentioned that you are looking to increase the wallet uh, from the uh, from our uh, uh, UK business. So, like, uh, what kind of synergies are you uh, seeing till now? Like, how are they panning out? So, I don't think we said it specifically with our UK business. It's a general statement for all our businesses. Uh, where we have opportunities to uh, kind of and the potential to sell Indian made equipment. There are uh, customers in certain geographies in Europe, uh, some parts of South America, East, uh, Southeast Asia that are value buyers. And it would definitely make more sense either building the entire vessel here in India uh, or also looking at maybe a hybrid solution where we build most of the vessel here and some components from the other geography. So low-cost sourcing from India will obviously uh, pick up steam. In the first year of this program, this year, uh, the budget was already crossed by about 300%. Uh, so we've already done exceedingly well in terms of this program. We also now planning a stock and sale a program where we will stock equipment in Europe uh, for the European market that will be sold by our German entity. Uh, so all these things are progressing quite well and the idea behind that is to really kind of come and get business that usually was not coming to Fordlo. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Jason Sones from Ashika Stock Broking. Please go ahead. Yes, sir, thanks for taking my question again. Um, you highlighted some one-offs, actually. I kind of missed on that. Could you just, just repeat that? Uh, um, on what, sorry? Uh, you had mentioned the one-offs in the quarter in the initial part of the call, but I missed, uh, missed that part. So... In the international businesses, so we yes. had not there sell. There is 300,000 euro provision for that. There is a power uh, cost increase in the range of $300,000 between Germany and the UK as well. And there is a 700,000 euro provision made for an order which was manufactured, but we were not able to ship to Russia. So these are obviously one-off and uh, won't be recurring, except for the power cost. If it continues to go up, then that will continue, but otherwise the other two are definitely one-off. So $300,000, uh, a power cost increase, and $700,000 provision for the Russia, for the Russian order. Yeah, and another 300000 for the Edlon sale, uh, for the fees, uh, the associated with the Edlon sale. So all in all, about 1.4 million euros, which probably impacts profitably at the, at the international business by about 1.5%. Uh, okay, so the total amount comes to how much did you mention? 1.4 million. 1.4 million euros. Yeah. 1.4 million. Sure. Okay. And uh, we, uh, just wanted uh, some uh, view on you, you know, from yourself on the pharma city development in Hyderabad. I remember a lot of time back you used to, you did used to speak about when you know uh, you were acquiring the DDPS facility, especially. So you said that you know you could address a lot of demand coming from the pharma city in Hyderabad. So just wanted to, uh, you know, to know your take on it, you know, what are the current developments and how is it shaping up? So that's a very interesting question and a very timely question because as we speak, the CEO of Fordland International is with uh, KT Rama Rao in Davos uh, meeting him and asking him to give us allocation for land in Pharma City. That's going on as we speak and maybe uh, there will be a tweet or something from the Telangana Ministry uh, later today. So the former uh, CEO was invited and uh, the, the government of Telangana wanted to discuss with us our plans and our expansion plans in Hyderabad. Uh, our current plan is in Nacharam, which has been earmarked for an IT development. So eventually five years down the line, we would have to leave that site. And we are now working with the government there locally to give us land allocation within Pharma City so we can then cater directly to the new uh, pharma uh, plants that will come up in that area. In terms of timing, uh, this is something that's been spoken about for quite some time. Um, I don't have a real clear idea in terms of, but land allocation, I believe, is complete. But I think over the next few quarters, once things start stabilizing after the pandemic, I think that got pushed back a little bit. But I think uh, people will start moving to pharmacy, uh, pharma city sooner than later. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Rohit Ori.
some progressive shares. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, uh, the question for uh, Pharma City is already asked. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask that uh, in terms of the green chemistry, are you are you thinking of moving towards hydrogen? No, so I think we were looking at green diesel technology. Uh, there were some other technologies specifically in the U.S. that the U.S. teams are working on. But we are really kind of uh, open-minded when it comes in to green technology. Is there something that we could even do in the EV space? I think recycling of batteries is becoming quite, uh, you know, important. And I think some of these sulfuric acid, uh, which goes into these batteries, require uh, glass line equipment as well. So something that uh, we can build around the glass line, having a heart of glass line, would be definitely an area. And maybe there could be new avenues and new maybe uh, the chemistries which can open up as well. So this is something that we are working on. Uh, and as soon as we have some more information on this, we will definitely uh, let you know. And would you like to share anything on uh, the uh, new developments for asset recovery as well? So asset recovery, uh, there's an ongoing project, one in India and one internationally. I think there was a recent order that we got from China as well in asset recovery. Uh, I think uh, asset recovery is something that we hope will grow the next few years. So maybe, uh, to be honest with you, it's not as grown as fast in India as I would have liked, but we are not stopping there. We are continuing our focus. We are going and meeting people and there are some strong opportunities in the pipeline. Hopefully, they will materialize into orders uh, in the next few quarters. Thank you. In order to ensure that the management is able to address questions from all participants, please limit your questions to one per participant. For any follow-up, may be requested to rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of Santosh Kumar Jha from Optimize IT System. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hi. Yeah. Uh, first of all, very, very con congratulations for the company's growth, earnings, and better performance. Sir, I have a little question about uh, the stock split. Here are any plans for quarter, uh, next quarter for stock split? No, no plans right now. Uh, you know, we... we could have split the stock this time as well, but then that would be the last split that we could have done because we already have two rupees and the lowest you can go to is one rupee. So maybe we keep it for later uh, when the time is right. But right now there are no plans for a stock split. I think the bonus itself will create liquidity, which we wanted to uh, create. Uh, so I think uh, the purpose has been solved and I don't think we need to look at the stock split for the, at least for the next few years. Okay, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Siddharth, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, in terms of technology and automation, I just want to know if you have already invested in or plan on investing in any asset lifecycle management software the system. So technology, digitization, optimization, of heavy invested, what are our plans? Maybe you can take that. Soon. Yeah, I'll take that. Um, so... You know, clearly, digitization, industry 4.0, et cetera, is happening all around us. Um, at GMM Powder, we want to make sure we invest in the right solutions that are relevant for our business. So um, we have um, thus far built up a basis, a baseline of systems in our factories, in our, um, in our operations in sales, uh, HR, IT, IT et cetera, where on which we can then take further and use the data that's coming on the system to drive decisions. So, um, you know, over the last couple of years, and really going into this year and probably the next, that foundation will be strengthened. Uh, we've already started uh, efforts to make sure things like our Salesforce system are used consistently across um, the corporation. And really the power of Salesforce is used, not just as a repository of sales leads, but actually to make smarter decisions. So Tarek talked earlier about Taking, uh, you know, figuring out which orders we really want to try that. We extensively use analytics uh, to make such kind of decisions. Uh, and in our factory, uh, we are using uh, digital systems for uh, project management, project tracking, and control, so that we have much better visibility on uh, on uh, how orders are progressing and getting when our uh, uh, when our um, uh, product will come out of the factory. 
Uh, and then last bit I'll touch on is on the product itself. You know, um, uh, a glass time vessel traditionally has not been a smart vessel. It's been a piece of equipment with a lot of technology in glass. But now we are also further enhancing our capacity to sensorize these vessels. So we have a portfolio of probes uh, that we currently sell in Germany. We are working to enhance that portfolio. Uh, whereby a customer can get a lot more detailed uh, information about process parameters uh, uh, for their uh, for the systems we sell to them. So we're pretty excited about the potential it offers. Uh, but this is uh, and so this is a priority for us. Uh, but we make sure that we invest where it makes sense, uh, and it will be a delicious combination of investment in systems and digitization across both uh, across three areas: our product. Uh, our factory processes as well as our processes and support functions also. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, due to time constraint, we take one last question from the line of Jason Soans from Ashika Stockbroking. Please go ahead. Yeah, sir. Thanks. Sir. This is my last question. Just uh, wanted to ask, uh, well, this PPA impact on the depreciation, we had, uh, you know, accounted, we had guided for a 6 million non-cash impact, of course. But uh, now this 15, um, uh, you know, this uh, 15 crore impact on deferred taxes. Just wanted some clarification on that because that wasn't expected. So if you could just show some color, I mean, I understand it is non-cash, but if uh, some color if it can be provided, your so seven million was yes, it was six to seven million was pretty much far for the post, but this was uh, this 15 million has come out. You know, the, the deferred tax that's basically eaten into the post. Right, Jason. So uh, what what is what has happened is uh, once you get into any acquisition, you get 12 months uh, to after that you need to review your opening balance sheet and get into what uh, you know are, are the assets and liabilities that you want to re, re uh, revisit. And as part of that exercise, uh, there was a different tax asset which is completely different from PPA. Uh, mm -hmm. There was a different tax asset which was existing in the balance sheet which you wanted to uh, write it off because that is uh, an asset which is not yielding any value in the future uh, period for us. And therefore, we had to take a uh, you know, write off in the p &L. And to that extent, our tax, you know, uh, as PAT, PVT ratio got uh, disoriented uh, to that extent. So this is, again, as you rightly mentioned, this is a non-tax item. Only the deferred tax asset goes down. And the uh, uh, you know the profitability to that extent uh, goes uh, down as well relatively. Uh, PPA whereas was an uh, opening balance sheet where once you acquire the business, you have the uh, asset allocation from the new management, and that's what we explained. I think uh, last quarter Q4. That's a completely different number from there. Thank you. We will take one more question from the line of Viral Sangvi, an individual investor. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, Tarak. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, hi, Vidal. How are you? Yeah, I'm all well. Thank you. Uh, you talked about the requirement of uh, good demand seeing from the pharma industry. Do you see any good uh, impetus also from the agro industry as well, which is going ahead? Yeah, so I think also from an agrochemical standpoint, there are large projects in discussion right now. People like UPL, BI industry, uh, Grafton, but not really for agro, but more for specialty care, uh, the epistolol. Uh, big money is investing as well. So across the board, we have seen a strong demand for chemicals. Uh, agrochemicals obviously will also pick up, uh, but it may be driven by specialty care. But even companies like Deccan, for example, are really investing in agrochemicals as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, thank and you. <laughs> thank you. And now hand the conference over to Ms. Priyanka Daga for closing comments. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Steven. Uh, thank you, Evan Priti, for joining us. Look forward to speaking to you during our next investor meeting. Thank you once again and good night. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of GMM, GMM Fordler Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines.